Maxie, I don't know if I would call you Paul. I think you're more like Barnabas because you're truly a son of encouragement. Everywhere you go, Maxie has fine things and nice things to say about everybody. And I think our brotherhood is better off having men like that, and we need more of them. And I really appreciate Maxie and Fran. They are like adoptive parents to some degree uh, for me. I've always loved them dearly, and they've been great encouragers to me. Uh, Jim Hall uh, was the one who physically brought me up to Brown Trail School of Preaching. He, uh, he put me in his car and we came up and he showed me around the school and introduced me to Brother Deaver and, and I started school uh, just a few weeks later here at Brown Trail. And as I look around, there are so many dear friends that have meant so much to me in preaching. Leslie McGaird, who has been a great friend for a long, long time and uh, Brother Richard Jones, whom uh, uh, I don't know. Sometimes I'm a little mad at Richard. I called Richard before I moved up to Oklahoma, and I asked him, I said, what's it like preaching in Oklahoma? And he said, oh, it's great. Well, the, But he didn't tell me something, and that is when you move to Oklahoma, you can't ever get back to Texas. And so, uh, you know, I'm in the, I'm in the uh, northern kingdom and uh, <laughs> prophesying up there and uh, trying to do the best I can with those folks. And then there's Jeff Jenkins, who is my very best friend. We, uh, Jeff talked me into uh, uh, coming on to a television show with him and co-hosting that with him. And it's turned out to be better than we expected, not because of us, but simply because of how it's reaching out into uh, the greater area of Oklahoma. We thought it was just going to reach about 30 miles out of Oklahoma City, but we get uh, cards and letters and phone calls from as far as 100 miles away and uh, hopefully that's reaching many, many lives. Uh, Ernie Christie is here today as well. Ernie is a dear, dear friend, graduated a few years before me here at Brown Trail. He's been preaching at Lakeshore Drive since Noah got off the ark, and uh, he's really been doing a great job there. And he told me a story at lunch that uh, is just wonderful. You know, the, the biggest movie of the year is Castaway. And uh, here recently they found a fellow on an island and uh, he, they asked him, he said, are you all by yourself? And he said, yes. He said, there's nobody else on this island. They said, well, that's strange. We found these three huts back in the jungle. He said, well, that's right. They said, well, what's that first one? He said, well, that's where I live. What's that second one? He said, well, that's where, that's where I attend worship. And what's that third one? He said, well, that's where I used to attend worship before I got mad and left. <laughs> there are so many. There's so many good friends that are here that nobody's going to get mad and leave. Uh, this is a great church, great eldership that has supported the school here at Brown Trail for uh, so many years now and have done a fabulous job of training young men. As I look out, there are many young men that the congregation where I'm at uh, helps support to go to this school. And so I know that there are pulpits being filled all over this country with, with men that have been trained and have been trained and to love the Word of God. And the commonality of what we're here to do today has a great deal to do with our love for the Word of God. And that is carried on throughout the Scriptures. As you look at the end of many great spiritual leaders' lives, you begin to see this thread of a love for the Word of God that runs throughout what they have to say. Moses, in his final address to Israel, will say in Deuteronomy 32, 46 and 47, Set your hearts on all the words which I testify among you today, which you shall command your children to be careful to observe all the words of this law. For it is not a futile thing for you, because it is your life. When people want to belittle the Word of God today, they need to read passages like this, because Moses said, this is the lifeline. The Word of God. The Word of God is your life. Joshua will say, and as he begins that great address to Israel, as he is more than likely on his deathbed, in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14, he says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth. He's speaking about the Word of God. If we're going to serve God in truth, we do so by knowing the book. David, in his advanced age, calls his son Solomon to his feet, begins to speak to him about how he will serve Israel as their king. And he says, Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. 1 Kings 2 and verse 3. Again, David shows Solomon that the way for him to lead God's kingdom was to lead them in truth, was 
was to love the Word of God and to bring to the ears of the people the commandments and the testimonies which God had given to him. We should love the Word of God in the same way that these men do. As Jesus is speaking to John in the Revelation, at the close of the Word of God in the last four verses that are found in the Word of God in Revelation 22, 18, and 19, we find that the warning is given that man should not add to nor take away from this fabulous Word which God has delivered unto man. God wants us to know that, that the most important thing in our lives in order to stay in connection with, with God and with the Son is to know the Word of God, is to understand that Word and to share it with others. As Jesus prepare, prepares His disciples for His own death, he does so by doing exactly the same thing as did Moses and Joshua and David. And uh, Jesus would later on do the same thing with John as the Word of God was about to close. He says "Teach that the Holy Spirit would teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And he will guide you into all the truth. John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. God promises that the Holy Spirit would come to these men, and that he would be a comforter for their lives, that they would be able to preach and teach the Word of God, that he would bring to remembrance those things which those men had already learned by sitting at the feet of Jesus for three years, and also would guide them into all truth. And this is what we are concerned with today is the great promise of the Holy Spirit. We begin by looking, first of all, at the paraclete. This is the word that is used four times in the section between John 14 and John 16 that basically means helper or comforter. That's the way it, was, it is translated in your New Testament. And this word, as it is used, means basically an intercessor or consoler, an advocate or a comforter. Thayer expands on that thought and says concerning the comforter, he is one summoned or called to one side, one who is called to defend another, an advocate, an intercessor, a succorer, a helper. We basically see in the use of this term a tremendous tenderness in the heart of Jesus for these men that he had spent so much time with. And he wants these men to understand that they are not going to be left alone, but that, that he is going to call one to their side. That's the literal, literal meaning of the comforter, to call one to one's side. When I was growing up, and uh, I was about 14 years old at China Spring High School. China Spring is smaller than the high school that my daughter uh, attended and just graduated from. The whole town is smaller than that. And uh, there were, I think, 26 in my class. And one day after lunch, uh, we were going to go throw the football around. And, and I was, as I was walking past the uh, concession stand to go out to the football field, two boys jumped me from behind and knocked me down. And I was there on my face. One of them was sitting right in the middle of my back. The other one was trying to pull my billfold out. And I guess they were going to uh, steal the money that I had in my billfold. Well, all of a sudden, those two boys were gone. That, that weight was just gone. That boy's no longer on my back. The other, other one wasn't trying to grab my billfold. And I rolled over to see my brother, who, uh, even though he was a small guy, he's very strong, and he had pulled one of those guys off, had him up against the concession stand, and uh, was about ready to, I think, pound his brains out, but we stopped that, fortunately. And then a friend of his, about six foot two, 200 pounds, ended up playing football for Prairie, uh, Prairie View A&M, named Lindsey Bradshaw. And they had pulled those boys off of me and had, I guess you'd say, in a sense, saved my life. They stood by my side at a time of great need. We recognize that Jesus is concerned. In John 14, 1, he will say to those men, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He wanted those men to know that there was something great waiting for them when their lives were over. And then later on in that same context, he says, And I'm going to send a helper who will guide you into all the truth. He wanted wanted them to know that you're not going to be alone. There will be one standing beside you. I'm calling the Holy Spirit alongside you that will be able to guide you into all the truth and help you in the difficulties that you will be facing within your life. So the work of the paraclete is precisely, is precisely here laid out by Jesus to his apostles as he comforts them on the night before his death. He wants them to know that they are not going to be alone and that they will have comfort. 
We find in several places in the Word of God this same kind of teaching that man is not going to be alone. Uh, and in, common, in commentaries concerning these things, for instance, Brother Burton Kaufman says that he is called another comforter in one of these texts, which identifies Jesus himself as the comforter of the disciples up until that time, the time that Jesus is about to die. And, uh, but he was preparing them for his departure to the Father. William Woodson, in a great uh, lecture done right here many years ago concerning the Holy Spirit, would say that the word allos means another of the same kind. Jesus, in reference to the Holy Spirit, promised a continuation of the relationship of guiding, comforting, defending, and strengthening the apostles, which he provided over the years of his public ministry. What we basically find here is that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one in nature and in purpose. There was not going to be a change of direction. There was not going to be the taking of the apostles uh, in a different way, but rather the continuation of what Jesus came uh, to do. The Holy Spirit would guide these men and lead them through the continuation of that. The second thing that we see concerning the promise of the Holy Spirit is that, or the promise to the apostles, is the performance of that promise. God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. God truly fulfills whatever he says he is going to do. And he will perform exactly what he told the apostles that he would do as Jesus promised them the Holy Spirit. Before his ascension, Jesus will say in Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. On the day of Pentecost, we begin to see the fulfillment of this great promise of the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Now, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. There are several things that take place on this day which uh, help in showing the fulfillment of this promise of John 14 and John 16. First of all, these men were able to preach things they had not previously studied. Now, several years ago, when I was preaching at a small town outside of, uh, outside of Dallas, I had a fellow come up to me and say that, that God had called him to preach and that he was able to get up the very first Sunday and uh, preach a great sermon. Well, I wasn't present for that sermon, didn't know anybody that was. But uh, I just looked at him and I said, that's really strange. I said, I've been preaching for a couple of years and, uh, and I have to study hard every week to have anything whatsoever to say on Sunday. I don't understand why God would do one thing for you and, and yet a different thing for me. Well, in the New Testament times, however, those men did have this special help of the Holy Spirit to be able to preach things they had not previously studied. And on the day of Pentecost, just as Jesus told them that they would have this guide that would guide them into all the truth, and in an earlier statement, he said, you will not have to worry about what you shall say or speak when you are dragged before magistrates and leaders, that they would have those things given to them at that time. Then uh, these men knew what to say on the day of Pentecost because God gave this to them by means of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, the Holy Spirit revealed the complete plan of obedience to man that had never before been presented to man. In Acts 2.38, we find that the Bible says that those who repent and are baptized shall receive the remission of sins. That had not been preached in that way, at least publicly. We know that Jesus had met with Nicodemus by night and had told them that except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. But this had not been publicly proclaimed in the way that it was on the day of Pentecost. And so we see this, this promise being fulfilled and these men preaching something that they had not previously known and, and, and giving the full presentation of the gospel of Christ. And then also they had complete recall of things that had happened before their eyes as they preached there in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost and began to speak about the things that God had done through Jesus. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. And then they begin to lay out for them the things that Jesus had done, which they had been witnesses of. 
And again, the Holy Spirit was giving these men these things. And they were also, of course, obviously speaking in the languages of all of those that were present. Now, we could argue about who, how that was done, whether they were all speaking a different language or whether men were simply understanding in their language. But uh, whatever the case was, however God did that, these men were able to hear something that had never been seen before because the Comforter had been called to the side of the apostles to guide them into all the truth. The apostles further more exposed the promise that had been given to them in direct fashion on the day of Pentecost saying, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. They point to the very fact of this promise that was given to them as they point out this is that which you have seen. These men had received this great promise which God had given to them. Within a short time after the day of Pentecost, the rest of the various things that the Holy Spirit was going to do for the apostles becomes very clear. The Holy Spirit is exposed as these men go about healing the sick, restoring the infirm, defending themselves before magistrates, and demonstrating many other powers given to them by the Holy Spirit. And so we recognize that God fulfills His promises. The performance of what God said that He was going to do is done. What is the purpose, therefore, of the promise to the apostles? The purpose behind the promises is variegated. There are so many different sides to this. One of the purposes is, first of all, the presence of deity with the apostles as they did their work. Jesus would say to them, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you, John 14. 16 and 17. Again, Jesus is very concerned that these men would understand the presence of deity with them. You and I need that kind of encouragement today. We need to understand that God is with us. Now, not in the same sense as with this very special revelation of the Holy Spirit to these men, but nonetheless, he says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We need that kind of encouragement. We need that kind of uplifting within our lives, especially those of you who preach the gospel. I asked a good brother one time that had been preaching for a long time, I said, do you ever think about quitting? He says, oh, only every day. And uh, that, that's really true sometimes. It's tough. It's difficult to preach. And yet these men were told they were going to have help with them. The obvious reason for this is to give us greater faith and greater confidence. The same writer says the, the reason for this is so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Hebrews 13 and verse 6. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they were going to need a lot of encouragement. Here they are trekking across a, a vast uh, deserted land most of the time. Uh, there was no food, no water. God would provide all of this for them in a very special way. In Exodus 13, 21, we see this encouragement given to them as God says that he will be with them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God wanted them to know that he was present with them. This was especially clear on the Day of Atonement when that cloud would come down and fill the Holy of Holies as the high priest would go in to make atonement for the children of Israel on that one day, Exodus 29 and verse 42. Jesus stayed with the apostles almost continuously throughout the three years of his ministry. He guided these men in their spiritual training. Now he leaves with them the promise of the Holy Spirit who would guide them through the presentation of God's truth to a lost and dying world. His abiding presence was necessary to the completion of their task. And God's presence with us through his word and promise is necessary to the completion of our task as well. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The second purpose behind this great promise is, is that uh, the Holy Spirit would teach and guide these apostles. John 14, 26 and John 16, 13. This was not the ordinary form of teaching, but rather a miraculous intervention uh, to give these men what to say at just the right time. Jesus had earlier spoken of this when he said, now when they bring you to synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how uh, or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say, Luke 12, 11 and 12. The word guide that is used here is a very unusual word. It normally would simply be translated teach or to give guidance or to teach or instruct. But it has a shade of meaning that would be so appropriate here, and that is to teach or instruct someone who previously had been totally ignorant of the subject. And that's what these men were. 
Now, this is not to negate the three years they had spent with Jesus. But there were so many other things that they needed to know. And so the Holy Spirit would guide them into all of the truth in order to know that. A third part of this promise is that the apostles would be given all of the truth. The word all is definitely at the heart of so many discussions, even among us today. Those who would claim that the epistles are simply holy suggestions or possible guidelines uh, that are not binding upon us would deny the reason for the use of the word all in this text. Uh, they would say, well, it's, it may not be all that we need. Uh, there may be some other that needs to be given. Some scholars teach that Jesus had taught the apostles everything that they needed, and all the Holy Spirit was going to do was to remind them of those things. But Jesus actually points out both, that you, he will put you in remembrance and that he will guide you into all of the truth. So the direction of this promise strongly suggests that the apostles had not been given all of the truth at that point in time. The Spirit would necessarily have to guide these men into the complete body of truth that God wanted all of them to have. The scramble today for allowances, which is so bothersome, people looking for loopholes within the truth, for doing things that are directly condemned in Scripture, or that the principles are taught that we condemn them, either specifically or generally, is based on the assumption that truth is vague. And it is an assumption. It's not the teaching of the Bible. The Bible points out its clarity and that we can understand it very clearly. Uh, some would even say that the Bible is incomplete. Such has always been the contention of the Pentecostal or charismatic movements uh, claiming the need for further revelation. Of the Mormons, for instance, uh, uh, one of the most maddening commercials on television has to do with when uh, the, the uh, Mormon church will come on and they'll talk about the Bible and praise it and talk about how great it is and they'll even hold a picture of it up before your face and then they'll say, but is this all there is? I want to scream out and say, yes, that's all there is. There's no other. Amen. And yet they want to say that there's more. And they claim that Joseph Smith uh, looked at those golden tablets, uh, also had to look down in a hat and some other silly stuff, and wrote out this book that we really, really need. I don't know about you, but when I want some comic relief, I read the Book of Mormon. I'm not trying to just put down folks, but folks, you have to use some good horse sense when you start reading something to see whether or not it's inspired by God or whether it's just made up by man. And as we look at the Word of God, we can see clearly this is God's Word. This is not man's Word. Man wouldn't write this book. Man flat wouldn't write this book because man would have glorified David, for instance, and would have said he never did anything wrong. David did do a couple of things wrong. God recorded it for us. Uh, God gave Solomon more wisdom than any man on this earth, but God very clearly pointed out he was a flawed individual. God is very honest. Man did not write this book. God did. And yet men today want to claim direct leading of the Holy Spirit, that we need more information, more revelation, and that the Holy Spirit is still working in the same way today as he did in the first century in the effort of revelation and then doing things to confirm the Word. The Word of God has been confirmed. And 1 Corinthians 13 says that it is a matter of childishness for men to want to hang on to those things that were intended just to be the scaffolding on the church as it was being built that those things have come to completion, and that the perfect has come. And I believe that there are several things involved in that. The perfect would in involve and include perfect love, which is the subject of 1 Corinthians 13. But perfect love comes as a result of a perfect revelation. Amen. And God has given that to us, and we do have that today. Uh, we even have some brethren today. We're fighting these battles among us today that are saying the Word of God is vague and, and uh, really only Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are authoritative, that uh, really the epistles are, are just holy suggestions so we can do really whatever we want to. Uh, the dodge uh, or the evasion of logic which says, uh, which of the New Testament churches do you want to restore? Well, how about the one that's taught perfectly in the New Testament? They want to say, well, you know, what about the church in Corinth? Flawed church. Brethren, we're all flawed churches because every one of us are human beings. But God presents the ideal in the Word of God. That's what we're trying to restore. That's what we're trying to preach and teach and live in and be a part of. And so these are just dodges. These are just evasions of the truth that God would want us to have. But men today think that they need more, and that they need, uh, that they need more than the Word of God. All of these attacks 
rip at the very fabric of Christ's clear biblical dynamic of a complete revelation lacking nothing. The Holy Spirit led the apostles into all of the truth. There is no more to be delivered unto man. Without the truth being complete, we could never have the knowledge needed today and would, and would therefore still be slaves to our sin because we would not be able to believe in Christ as we should. John 8 and verse 24. The Bible has presented to us, according to 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, everything that pertains unto life and godliness. That's truth. That's from the Word of God. And we do not need anything else because Christ called to the side of the apostles the Holy Spirit who guided these men into all of the truth and had them deliver this to us. Well, that brings us to the product. What did this promise produce? When Jesus calls the Holy Spirit to the side of the apostles, what was produced as a result of that great promise? What John has recorded for us here is the foundation for the written word which we have in our very hands today. The thoroughness of what Jesus promises pays off in an understandable, teachable, complete, perfect, and effective inspired text. The Old Testament is resplendent with teachings on the accuracy of the Word of God. David pens, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 19, 7 through 9. We gather from that great text that the Word of God is certain, it's accurate, and realize that that was written in a time in which it was not complete. But they knew that what God had revealed to them was what they needed. Solomon would include in wisdom literature such statements indicating the accuracy of the Word as found in Proverbs 22 and verse 21. That I may make you know the certainty of the words of truth, that you may answer words of truth to those who send uh, to those who send to you. Daniel would go so far as to defend the certainty of anything God said before uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he says to him, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and the interpretation is sure. Just as that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had is certain and sure, so is the word of God that you and I hold within our hands today. In the New Testament, we see the product of the Bible being moved toward completion. Note what Bible writers had to say, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Luke 1 and verse 4, Luke says to Theophilus, he will later say to him, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Spirit had given commands to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, Acts 1, 1 through 4. He says to Theophilus, these things are infallible. God has presented us a certain word that we can understand. Peter would encourage the dispersion to remain faithful to the Lord because of the certainty of the word of God which they had received. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spake as as they who, who were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1 and verses 19 through 21. Because the Holy Spirit was sent to guide these men into all the truth, we now have a complete revelation from God that can give us all we need to obey Jesus Christ unto salvation. The Bible also assists us in discerning whether what a man preaches is scriptural. These were more fair-minded, the New King James says, than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word of God with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Acts 17 and verse 11. Paul would say in such concise and yet complete language, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We have a divine product in the Bible that came not from man, but from the breath of God to our minds as we study it and obey its words. This indeed is indeed 
the intended result of the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is the product. What about the power? And we're not talking today about the power of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about what is the power of this promise. Now that we recognize what the product is, the Word of God, what is the power that we hold within our hands? The power of this promise should be very obvious, I believe. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. First of all, I believe that the, that the Bible has life-changing ability. The Holy Spirit comes and guides these men into a truth that is so powerful that it can change men's lives. This is undeniable evidence of the Bible's divine origin. The kingdom of God is not in word but in power, Paul will write, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 20. The proof of what the Holy Spirit came to do in fulfillment of uh, the promise to guide into all the truth is the effect that the word of God has on our lives. It can change the alcoholic into a sober and obedient servant of God. It can change the criminal and cause him to repent of his ways and to serve the master in integrity and in honesty. It can change the immoral person and can bring them to a life of purity that they have never known before. It can change the coward into a courageous Courageous one who will stand up against the detractors of Jesus Christ. The Word of God changed a zealot named Simon into a follower of Jesus. It changed simple fishermen into men who were so bold that when they stood up before the Sanhedrin, they would say, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus, Acts 4 and verse 13. God's word could change a murderous, obsessive Saul of Tarsus into one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, Acts 22 and verses 1 through 16. Secondly, we also find concerning this word that Jesus would use the word of God himself. Matthew chapter 4 is so powerful. And brethren, I think something the church really needs to study today. I think folks have lost, for some reason, confidence in the word of God. It may be because many preachers from pulpits have lost confidence in the Word of God. And it preaches as if it is powerless, as if it can't change anybody's lives, and if it's not really going to do anybody any good. I think many folks act as if this is just a waste of time. But when we look to Matthew 4, we recognize Jesus never thought of the Bible being a waste of time. He's been, he has just been baptized. He has been taken into the wilderness for 40 days to fast. Satan makes a frontal attack upon Jesus Christ to tempt him with those three darts that he is so prone to hurl. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the vainglory of life. And in each of those cases, Jesus answers with Scripture. Now that's interesting. We know that God has the power to overthrow Satan. In fact, in the end of the book of Revelation, what's going to happen? When this world comes to a conclusion... As it appears that the forces of evil are going to overrun the world, God in one fell swoop is going to wipe those forces away and Satan and all of his hosts will be swept away into hell. God has the power to overthrow Satan. That tells me that more than likely Jesus had that power as well. Jesus could have done something to Satan that day. I don't know what he would have done, but he could have done something different than what he did probably but instead Jesus quotes scripture man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God you shall not tempt the Lord your God you shall worship your the Lord your God and him only shall you serve now, folks that tells me Jesus Christ didn't think that this was a waste of time he didn't think that this was powerless that it couldn't do anything to change the lives of people. Jesus understood that this was life-changing and life-saving. And therefore, he quoted the Word of God in answer to Satan. Let's be a people who believe in the great power of the Word of God. Let's be a people who believe that it can change lives, that this once and for all delivered unto the saints' faith that God has given to us is that gospel that can blow apart the wall that exists between God and man. It can destroy sin within our lives. It can bring us into a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And it can cause us to be able to enter in 
that beautiful place which Jesus spoke of in John 14 as we began today. We wield both from the pew and the pulpit a sword with power far beyond this world. We must embrace this power and let it work through us to change others. The gospel can blow apart that wall that exists between man and God, but only if we preach it, live it, and teach it. While so many today are bent on throwing away the sword, we should be about the business of sharpening its blade by committing it to memory, by preaching it everywhere, and by helping young people to pick it up and to develop themselves in its use. We are so indebted to the work of the Holy Spirit and what He has done through holy men of God in revealing God's commands to us. May we always study it with great anticipation of spiritual growth and renewal. May we ever obey all that is written and strive to never go beyond that which has been written, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. And may we forever defend the faith against all who would reduce it to mere human wisdom and suggestion.